Good morning, thank you. Uh, good morning, thank you all for attending today. I'm Michelle Vigeant, and today I'll be talking to you about the science of concert hall acoustics, research, and design. The primary goal when studying concert hall acoustics to improve design is to try to link quantities, numbers that we can measure about the sound, so in order for us to predict human perception. So if we take an example, this concert hall here, which is in Switzerland, you can see it has many uh, architectural features which are to help the sound. For example, this large reflector above the stage, the side walls have shaping. Uh, so the walls and the materials in the hall are going to affect how the sound bounces or reflects around the room. So if we looked at a top view, this would be our sound source. So for example, that piano and then a the microphone or you the listener and you can see how the sound is reflecting off the different surfaces and this is creating what we would call a sound field. And so in order to have good acoustics, we want to ideally shape and design our space so that it's perceived that way as sounding good. Now of course, there's many other aspects to people's perception if they like a concert hall and that has to do with the architectural, how it looks, and also how good the orchestra is, if they like the pieces. So there's a lot that goes into it, but we, um, for my work, focus on their perception of the sound. And so in order to try to design to achieve these good acoustics, we need to take from this sound field measurements or simulations where we can actually get quantities or numbers. And what we're trying to do is come up with numbers that will relate to perception. And so if we have these numbers that we can quantify the sound, we can then do a better job designing the space. So if you were to ask someone what um, they think makes good acoustics, you're going to get a range of answers from people. They'll use lots of different terminology. Terms that might be used would be texture or the hall sounds warm. There's good balance between the orchestra. We would get uh, many, many terms. And so what we need to do is come up with a set list of vocabulary of all these various attributes that contribute to uh, overall room acoustic impression or more generally just hall preference. And so reverberance is one of the terms that's been well defined and well studied and this is the sense of how long it takes sound to, uh, how sound lingers in a space. And so you may um, have experienced hearing musicians, they like to be play in, for example, under this tunnel where the sound will be very reverberant, it will sound very full. A similar but opposite um, characteristic that we consider when we're considering our perception of good acoustics is clarity. Um, you've likely experienced being in large spaces where there's announcements coming over the PA system and they're completely unintelligible and that's because we have very poor clarity. And so in a hall we're trying to achieve a good balance of clarity where you can hear the individual instruments but also still have that lingering or reverberance. And there are other attributes that contribute to preference, but one of the key attributes that contributes to preference that hasn't been studied very well is envelopment, the sense of the sound surrounding you in all directions. And in order to better quantify envelopment, we need to have um, something, a quantity that we can uh, measure about the sound field to determine uh, if we've achieved good or poor envelopment. And so the, it comes down to those reflections or those sound bounces that I showed you. And in order to better understand envelopment, the preliminary research has shown that we need to know when the reflections arrive at the listener and what direction they come from. Is it primarily from the front or behind or is it really from all directions? And so before I talk a bit more about that, I just want to give you a sense of a uh, bit more detail about reflections in space. And so what we do is we can take, we go into a space and if we were listening, there's a violinist on the stage and someone sitting in the audience, or we can take measurements. And what we do is we can quantify it in terms of this sound decay over time. And so the first sound that you would hear is the direct sound. So that's coming directly from the piano to you. And that will have the sound that will come first and it will have the highest level or be the loudest. And then we're going to have sound that uh, is going to reflect off individual surfaces, um, one or two, three bounces. And so off the floor to you, off one of the side walls to you. And these are what we call the early reflections. And early reflections uh, have similar level to the direct sound, but they're a bit lower and they come a bit later. 
Well, the sound continues to bounce around the space and lose energy as time continues, and eventually you start to get a lot of reflections all around the same time um, at much lower levels, and that uh, is the uh, reverberation, the reverberance that you would perceive. So back to envelopment then, what parts of the, this um, sound decay are what really contributes to envelopment? And so what procedure can we use to actually study this? You can do uh, simulations, but uh, in my group we've been doing a lot of measurements. So in our recent work we've developed, a, we've measured eight local halls and we wanted to get halls that were a range of sizes, a range of acoustic properties so that we could have lots of different spaces so that people could evaluate them and have different sounding envelopment. And so you can see there's also different uses, recital hall, concert hall, lecture hall. Two of these here are on campus, this is the Esber recital hall and this is the large Thomas uh, lecture hall. <coughs> And so what we do is we take these measurements and then we reproduce them in a special facility that we have here on campus that has 30 loudspeakers. And what we can do is a person can then go into the facility and hear any number of these halls uh, with classical music and then they sit in the facility and rate them, which I'll talk more about in a moment. In order to get the measurements to do this reproduction, we need a very special microphone. And as uh, Dr. Sharkey mentioned, we've had technological advances, and this microphone is something that's only really been available in the last 10 years. In a space, of course, the sound is surrounding us in three dimensions. And so we have to be able to measure this in 3D in order to reproduce it in 3D. And so we use a special microphone that's a sphere that's about three and a half inches in diameter, and it has 32 half-inch microphones evenly distributed over this sphere. Uh, this was actually developed by a Penn State grad, Gary Elko, from the graduate program in acoustics. And in this manner, we can capture the sound coming from all directions. So we take measurements in spaces. We then use, from our special microphone, we reproduce them using a method called ambisonics. And we then have people listen to them. And we're not only having them evaluate them in terms of envelopment, but also we might ask them about preference or reverberance. And we ask them to rate them. And so the way that we do this is we have uh, a tablet, as you can see here. And subjects have the freedom. This is where there's eight different concert halls, let's say. And so they could listen to A and think about how enveloping does that sound. They could listen to E and how enveloping. And they can sweat, switch in real time between the different halls. So it's very difficult to take people to a hall and have them listen and then move them to another hall and have them listen and evaluate. So we can do A-B comparisons. And then people rate, for example, not at all enveloped to envelopment with the slider baller. And we found that participants find this quite intuitive and they like that they can uh, compare back and forth. And so what have we found from our research thus far? As I mentioned, we want to know what part of this sound level decay really contributes to envelopment. And so what we found is it's a portion of this early sound from starting from about 60 milliseconds, and then it's a much larger part is this late sound. Previous research had a very strict cutoff of 80 milliseconds contributing, but we found a much more specific that it's part of the early sound and a lot of the late sound. And so to answer our other question, because we have this special three-dimensional microphone measurements, we can also get a sense of which direction the sound com is coming from that gives us the highest sense of envelopment. And what we found, it is primarily from the sides, which previous research has shown, but previous research had a very narrow um, defined angles. And what we found is that the energy that's coming from about plus or minus 20 degrees from in front of you doesn't contribute very much to envelopment. And then also energy from behind you also doesn't. So I know this diagram is kind of confusing, but this is the idea of how much sound coming from here and here is what really contributes to envelopment. So by knowing when reflections are arriving and what direction signs, um, uh, reflections are arriving, we can then design for our architectural space to have achieve those reflections to have higher envelopment, which is directly related to preference. 
And so we have funding to carry on and do measurements at much larger halls, which I'm very excited about. We're doing that this summer. Uh, we're going to take measurements in a number of American halls and European halls, and so that we have examples of both. These are considered to be the top three halls in the world, um, but we do want to measure all types of halls, not just ones with excellent acoustics, because we want to have a range of acoustics so that we can have people evaluate them in terms of preference, and we want to see how much envelopment and reverberance and clarity factor into their overall preference. And so we can then do a better job in designing our spaces. Um, as I, uh, Dr. Sharkey mentioned, we really want to support graduate students. And this work is really um, due to my two amazing graduate students, David Dick and Matthew Neal. And this has been funded by the National Science Foundation. Thank you.